it has always been a blessing to me to be able to be here and to first get to know the brethren of this congregation and then to each year be able to renew friendships. It's always a, an encouragement to be with the good elders of this congregation. Appreciate them a great deal. Their stand for the truth. Appreciate Brother David and Sister Jody. And they each year uh, put me up and they take care of me. So it is greatly appreciated. We have a long friendship and that is a very dear friendship to me. Prior to the creation, God made a plan to save sinful mankind. And that plan included the sending of His Son to die upon the cross for sinful mankind. In that death, Jesus purchased the church, Acts 20 and verse 28. In being raised from the dead, he would then appear to his apostles and he would tell them in Matthew 28 and verse 18 that all power has been given unto me or all authority hath been given unto me in heaven and in earth. He is thus the head of the church. Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, Colossians 1 and verse 18. He is the only head of the church. He does not share that headship with anyone else. He doesn't give it to anyone else. In spite of what millions of people across the world think in relationship to a false teacher who calls himself the Pope. As the head of the church, he is the one who has the right to give orders, to make decisions, and to enforce obedience. That's the definition of authority. He is that one who is in control. He has established his laws, and he reveals those laws to man in the Scriptures. And for us today, in the New Testament. But in purchasing the church, there is a certain organization within the church. And we're not going to spend time except to mention that the church is used in thus a universal sense, Matthew 20, uh, 16 and verse 18. And it's used in a local sense, both from a geographical region or area, Galatians 1 and verse 2. But then it's also used in relationship to specific congregations, Revelation 1 and verse 4 and other passages. We see within that local congregational sense of the church, the organization within that church in Philippians 1 and verse 1. When Paul, introducing the letter, addresses it to the church at Philippi, or they that are at Philippi, with the bishops and deacons, but he says it's addressed to all the saints. And so we see here's the saints, and that would be a wonderful study all on its own as to what a saint is. Basically, it is one who has been freed from his sins and is thus dedicated and consecrated to God. Then there's the use of the term deacons, that is a servant. But our discussion this evening deals with the elders, here called the bishops. They are, though, also called elders, pastors, shepherds, overseers. There are three main Greek words that are used in relationship to these men. Each one of those words carries with it the idea of authority. Presbyteros is an elder or a presbyter. A shepherd or a pastor, that is the Greek word poimen, 
and then episkopos, which is translated bishop or overseer. But though that shows that these men do have authority. As Paul calls the elders of Ephesus to Miletus to discuss with them, as he's discussing with them, he says to take heed unto yourselves and all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. There's these words that are used, and we see within these the aspect of authority. They are referred to as elders in verse 17. But these elders oversee the church. This is that word episkopos, and I think it's interesting what Roy Deaver says about this word. And the lexical definition, he says that one, that there are things to be done by others. Two, these things to be done by others are to be done rightly. Three, an overseer is obligated to see to it that these things are done, these things done by others are done rightly. Four, an overseer has the duty of seeing that the things done by others are done rightly. Thus, we start seeing the aspect of authority within those who are elders. Then, Paul tells them they are to feed the church. This is the verbal form of that Greek word poimen, that, again, deals with shepherding, uh, pastoring. And, again, you have an aspect of authority within that word. And he tells them that they are to watch. Uh, that is, as he goes on in verse 29 uh, and 30, that they are to watch because there's going to be false teachers among them, even men from their own selves that would arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Well, the aspect of watch, again, carries an idea of authority, that they are to give strict attention to something, to be cautious, to take heed, and... It deals with one who has the responsibility of watching and warning. But in order to do that, he has to have the authority to do it. He has to have the authority to watch. He has to have the authority to warn. Within the very qualifications of elders itself, we have the aspect of authority when they are to be able to rule their own house well because there's the need for them to rule the house of God or take care of the house of God. And if they don't know how to rule their own house, then there's no way that they can properly take care of the church. <clears throat> Then there's the aspect of ruling in 1 Thessalonians 5 in verse 12. When Paul says, We beseech you, brethren, to know them which, are, which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. The word translated over is the same word that's translated ruler, ruleth in 1 Timothy 3. And so here's, they are to, uh, the members are to know those individuals who are over them or ruling them and to admonish them. In 1 Peter, the fifth chapter, verses 1 through 4, again, there's the terms that are seen in that aspect of authority when he tells them to feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof. 
And so there's that feeding the flock. That, again, is that verbal form of shepherding, of poimane. Taking the oversight is, again, a verbal form of that word episkopos. Oversights, overseeing. Now, Peter does warn them, don't be dictators of the flock. But being a dictator would be an abuse of the authority that they have. The abuse of something, in reality, proves the right of them to have it. You cannot abuse something that you don't have. And thus, they have authority. In Hebrews 13 and verse 17, Paul would say to obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves. For they watch for your souls as they that must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable to you. Again, elders are to rule. And again, the idea of rulership here carries with it authority. It is a word which elsewhere is used of governors, as Joseph and Pilate would have had authority over their citizens as governors, so elders have authority over the members. And members are to obey them. That means that they yield to their decisions. And we'll get into that in a minute. But again, it clearly indicates the authority that elders possess if members are to obey them. And he also says that members are to submit to them. That's yielding to the authority that they possess. So again, the authority of elders. But then we also need to ask the question what kind of authority these men have that are elders. As we noted at the beginning of the lesson, Matthew 28th chapter and verse 18, Jesus says that all authority hath been given unto me in heaven and in earth, or all power the King James has. Some will go to this verse and say, well, see, Jesus has all authority, Therefore, elders cannot have authority. But Jesus has the right to delegate authority. In fact, the same word that is translated authority or power in the King James in Matthew 28, 18 is used for the authority of the apostles in 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 8. And so if the apostles had that same authority that Jesus had, the same type of authority, then others could as well. Jesus had delegated authority to the, elder, to the apostles. There's authority within the home in relationship to the parents and the children. The husband being the head of the wife. So there's authority within the home. There's authority within the government. There are other types of authority that are delegated by God. Well, again, the idea of authority is the power or the right to give commands, to enforce obedience, to take action, or to make final decisions. As head of the church... Jesus possesses a th original authority. He is the only one who has the right to make laws for the church. No one ha else has that right in spite of those who would teach that the church somehow has it and misuse many times Matthew, 20, uh, Matthew 16 and verse 18 and 19 that Peter was given authority, and that authority is passed then on to other popes, and they have the right, when they speak ex cathedra, or give a papal bull, to make rules. 
They have that supposed authority, but they don't. Jesus is the only one that has that original authority to make laws. And those laws are set forth for us within the pages of the New Testament. Elders, as they do their work of oversight, they do not have original authority. They do not have that right to make laws for God. God has already made those laws. But elders are granted delegated authority. When God gives, or when Christ gives an obligation for a man, there are within that obligation certain areas of expediency, human judgment. Jesus gave a great commission to the apostles and, of course, it goes to us as well, to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. We have that same commission that we are to go in the world as well. The command, though, in relationship to those apostles and us is to go. But there is a human judgment that is related to fulfilling that command to go. During the first century with the apostles, as they received that command, that authority to go from that one who has that original authority, could make the decision, well, we're going to walk. Or we're going to ride a donkey to go. They could have gone by boat. All of those ways are still authorized by God. They might not be expedient for us. Now, they might be for maybe a couple of people, especially uh, walking and <clears throat> maybe would be good especially the way some people drive. But uh, those things might not be expedient for us. But the command to go involves any way in which we can accomplish that going. And so we today can decide to get an automobile and drive to that location that or go to in that manner. Or as I did on Wednesday, I went to the airport, I got onto a plane, and I flew here. Those ways were authorized. A few years ago, it was very popular to take the trains. All of those ways are authorized. It becomes a decision as to which way is the best way to accomplish the command. How are we best going to go? And today, riding a donkey or walking might not be the most expedient way. When it comes to a local congregation and decisions that affect a congregation, it is the elders of the congregation who possess that authority of making decisions in those matters of expediency and carrying out the commands that God has given unto us. Again, with those commands, there's that area of expediency. Who's going to make the decision? Some have come along, of course, and said, well, elders can't really make that right decision. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But some want to make it a, well, let's just vote on it. Have a, everybody vote. 
or some would just rather it be chaos and nobody make any decision and just everyone do what they want to. Uh, but elders are the ones who have been given that authority to make decisions. Uh, let's make an application of it. The elders of this congregation in their oversight of this congregation and realizing their responsibility to feed the congregation, to provide for them the spiritual nourishment that is needed, they desire, decide because they have the authority to hire a man to work with them in preaching the gospel. And so they make the decision, we want to hire David Brown. Now, that's the elder's right to make that decision. And we'll notice that we as members of a congregation have the, the obligation to submit to that authority. Well, maybe David wasn't my favorite choice. Doesn't matter. That's the elder's right to make that decision. It's not to be put up for a congregational vote. It's not to simply, well, whoever wants to do it can do it. No, the elders have that obligation in feeding the flock to hire a preacher and they make that decision. And the congregation is to support that decision. There are decisions that we have in relationship to the contribution. We give our money upon the first day of the week as God commanded us in 1 Corinthians 6 and 16 and verse 1 and verse 2. We are to give as we have been prospered. Well, what about the use of that money? Well, God has certainly set forth an area in which the elders are to use that money in relationship to the work of the church. Well, let's say here are some individuals over here, and we say we have several sound men who are needing financial support in the preaching of the gospel. They have the right to go into a foreign field, let's say, they have the right to be supported by a congregation or congregations. Which ones are we going to support? Or which one? And how much are we going to support that individual or individuals? Some individuals will wrongly say, well, I want to support this person over here, so I'm going to withhold my contribution and I'm going to send my money over here. That's sinful, brethren. Don't have that right. Now, if I give my money to the local congregation and I also want to do that, that's fine, as long as the individual is sound, of course. But who makes the decision? Who are we going to support? How much are we going to support? That's the carrying out of the authority that God has given, the expediting of those laws that God has made. The elders are the ones who have to make those decisions. Now then, there are some, though, who object to elders' authority. They claim such that elders who make decisions likened to that set themselves up as dictators over the church. And so any time any eldership makes a decision, they're just dictators over the church. Well, no, they're not. They're just carrying out the God-given obligation that they have as elders in overseeing the congregation. But that's what they claim. Some will say, well, all of the members have the same right as any other member, including elders. And so, 
I have as much right as the elders, or Joe Blow over here has as much right as the elders, and so they can't really make decisions. We all have that right. And sometimes they will object to elders meeting by themselves, which uh, wise elders normally do at times because there is work that the church needs to be taken care of and they're meeting to make sure that that work is taken care of and they're shepherding the flock in relationship to the congregation and the members of the congregation and they're going to be discussing those members and they're going to be asking and, dis and dealing with the problems of those members and they're going to be trying to make sure as they have that obligation that, that those members get to heaven. And so, yes, they're going to be meeting by themselves in the carrying out of their obligation as elders. But some say, oh, no, you can't meet like that. And then there's some who believe that any decision that is made by the elders then has to go to the congregation for a congregational vote. And any preacher who's been looking for a place to preach any time at all knows how many times that happens within congregations. And it's wrong. It's not how it's to be done, in spite of what some think. It's the elders who have that obligation, that decision-making process, and they are not ones who then run it through the membership to get the approval of the membership. Again, as one looks at this idea of authority in Matthew 28 and verse 18, Jesus, all authority. It's that Greek word exousia, and thus they get a catching upon that Greek word exousia. And saying that since Jesus has all exousia, then no one else has any. But in Matthew the 20th, they will also tie in Matthew 20, verse 25 and 26. When Jesus calls his apostles and says unto them, You know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority upon them. But it shall not be so among you, but whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And they claim that Jesus is speaking of exousia when he says that it shall not be so among you. And thus they claim that there can be no exousia authority in a congregation or among the Lord's followers. It's interesting, though, that the exercise dominion here in Matthew, the 20th chapter, is not exousia. It's another Greek word. But the context is that Jesus is not speaking of that type of a situation at all. Jesus is dealing with and contrasting, here's true greatness. Here's what the Gentiles think true greatness is. Here's what really is true greatness, and it's to, this is what's to be among you. Gentiles' standard of greatness was based upon position and authority. Jesus' true standard of greatness was based upon service to others. That's the context of what Jesus is dealing with here. And thus, when he says, it shall not be so among you, he's dealing with, and he's saying, that standard of greatness among you will not be the Gentiles' standard of greatness. That's not the true standard of greatness. The true standard of greatness is that of service. But it does not, and Jesus is in no way eliminating the proper exercise of authority in this. If they did, then the apostles would have sinned in exercising the authority that they had in 2 Corinthians 10th chapter and verse 8. And it does not eliminate the elders' authority within the local congregation. 
Then in 1 Peter 5 and verse 3, we mentioned some will argue that they are not to be lords over God's heritage. And thus if elders make decision relating to the congregation without first receiving the approval of the congregation, then whatever that decision is, it doesn't matter what it is, but whatever it might be, they're lording it over the flock. And thus, the only authority, according to these individuals, that an elder possesses is that of being an example. Well, it's interesting that the word lords there is the same word as exercising dominion in Matthew 25 and verse, or 20 and verse 25. It's not exousia. An abuse of a right does not exclude the right itself. The proper exercise of, in this case, the authority that they possess. But failure to respect elders' authority. I think Numbers, the 16th chapter, shows us really that we are to obey and submit to the elders' authority by using an example back here in, with Kor, Dathan, and Abiram. Here's these priests who lead a group of 250 in a rebellion against Moses and Aaron. And Moses and Aaron had delegated authority from God. But Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, in leading this rebellion, claimed, Moses and Aaron, you take too much upon yourself. In verse 3. Then in verse 13, they accuse him, Thou make thyself altogether a prince over us. As if that was wrong and sinful. And then again in verse 3, they said, All the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among, all, among them. And thus, don't take that authority, Moses and Aaron. You're wrong in doing such. Moses' response, as we see in verse 7, Ye take too much upon you. In verse 11, you gathered together against the Lord. It wasn't simply a rebellion against Moses and Aaron. Moses said, in this rebellion, you are rebelling against God. That's how God views rebellion against his delegated authority. It doesn't matter if it was Moses in this situation or if it's the elders today. When you rebel against God's delegated authority, you're, de you're rebelling against God himself. In verse 28, Moses says, Ye shall know that the Lord hath sent me to do these works, for I, for I have not done them of mine own mind. They were fulfilling what God had authorized them to do. And then he says, They shall understand that these men have provoked the Lord. Verse 30. We see God's attitude in that the ground opened up and buried these rebels alive. And then fire goes out from the Lord and consumes the 250 men who had joined with the rebels in verses 32 through verse 35. That's God's response to these rebels. If God responded in that way to the rebels, then what is God's response going to be in relationship to those who will rebel against his delegated authority as far as the elders of a local congregation? 
I don't realize the earth isn't going to open up and swallow anyone today, but they're going to stand before God in judgment on the last day, and they're going to give an account for that rebellion, and they're going to be lost in an eternal separation from God in hell. Why? Because they rebelled against God's delegated authority. But also, there needs to be obedience to the elders of a local congregation to prevent turmoil in the congregation. In 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 12 and 13, We beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. Now notice this. And be at peace among yourselves. When people rebel against the elders of a local congregation, there's going to be turmoil. There's going to be troubles within the congregation. The way to have peace within a congregation is to recognize the authority of elders and to submit ourselves to that authority of elders. That, of course, is as they faithfully carry out God's will. But that's going to produce peace within the congregation. Why? Everyone's then going to be on the same page, if to use our terminology. Everyone's going to be working together. Not going here and there because, well, I think this and I think that. There's unity within the congregation and peace because everyone's working toward that same goal. And then in Hebrews 13 and verse 17, he says to obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves for they watch for your souls as they that must give account that they may do it with joy and not with grief for that is unprofitable to you. Elders have an awesome responsibility. They have to give account of the action of the souls under their care. That means when you are a part of this congregation. The elders of this congregation are going to give an account whether you're saved or not. Their soul is in, your soul is in their hands. God's going to hold them accountable. And thus, they have a responsibility to get you to heaven. In fulfilling that responsibility, they make decisions for the congregation. And yes, the feeding of the congregation and making sure that a congregation is fed and a proper spiritual diet. Including in that, it's going to be many times, worshiping on Sunday night. Having Bible classes on Wednesday night. Having a lectureship such as this. And other times in which there's going to be a proper feeding of the congregation. They're trying to get you to heaven. If you rebel against their authority, then the word literally is groaning results. There's groaning. Why? Because of a lost soul. You have rejected their attempts to help you attain heaven's home. And you're going to be lost in spite of the work and the efforts of those faithful elders. Oh, elders and obedience to elders is going to be profitable for all. For you, because you're now going to attain heaven's home, and for them, because they've helped you reach that ultimate goal. What an awesome work the work of elders is. That they have that job to get a congregation to heaven. So many times elders get so caught up in mundane things that they lose sight of souls. Faithful elders are going to be interested in the souls that are under their care. 
and they're going to make decisions that are based upon that so that they can get those souls to heaven's home. Thank you for your attention.